I'm sharing my screen. Let me know when you see it. Uh, it's not yet up. Yes. Trying should be fine now. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, we can see it now. Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the second day of the practical workshop regarding the contract management phases. Uh, for the agenda of today, um, we'll start with an introduction to make um, a little recall about what we have discussed here today. Then um, do an overview of the proposal and uh, the bid phase and explain the role of the contract manager in this phase. I will walk you through uh, some key clauses, some negotiation tips then give you some examples like to yesterday before concluding. So yesterday uh, we have discussed the following shimmy which explain an overall of the proposal bid phase, um, which is from tendering, contract review, commercial negotiation, traveling, uh, tr transfer, sorry. This is regarding the tender phase. And then for all design production, and delivery and solution commissioning, warranty period, and then the aftermarket, or what we call it customer care at certain uh, organizations, and all the people that they are involved during the whole life cycle of the contract. It's not only the contract manager who is doing everything, but he has I mean, a lot of people who interact with such engineering, lawyers, finance team, cost controllers, project managers, site team planners um the sales managers supply chain and logistics yesterday as well we have seen um make an overall view of the tendering phase which the main uh i can tell tasks uh, of the contract manager she's like the review and the draft of the tnc's assist the team with the client negotiations to be sure at certain some points, which are, I mean, the last versions of the template, last versions of the technical specifications, the annexures that might be included in the contract, the KPIs, LDs, payment terms, and the applicable law. And here in the following slides, I will walk you through more in detail on such um, task and inconsistent and what mainly. So when we talk about draft and review of the contract um, or the contract document, means to be sure that the right version of the TNCs is used for the appropriate project. What we mean by that in like big, big companies or like uh, in most of the companies, they have their own TNCs, but it's not. I mean, the same document is the same applicable for each project or each type of project. They have TNCs for service, they have TNCs for procurement, TNCs for like turnkey projects. So just to be sure when we are issuing tender, the right TNCs are used. And sometimes it's a project or we have the other party, they have their own TNCs as well. So they insist to use theirs. And here it comes that we need to find a middle of the road agreement. So the contract manager is uh, in charge of marking up this, that we can call them non-standard TNCs for the organization. And then they like to, to they comment if they have any comments, if there are some things that they are not online with their own culture as an organization so they can find the middle of the road agreement and take it for negotiation with the customer to maintain record, records of all either those negotiations or any change for the specifications or for the scope because it's very important to not create frustration because sometimes the other party said ah you are delayed you take more time to review you take more time to come back to us 
So it's very important to keep record to be sure that, I mean, everyone is aligned, everyone is informed about the progress of the file. And then confirm the same TNCs in the order confirmation. This is very important because sometimes we, during the tender or the, the bid phase, we take time to negotiate to set the right TNCs, but we re re receive an order or a purchase order with a completely different TNCs. It doesn't mean that the other party ignored what we have been doing since long time, but it's their own system that it's per default, it issue their own TNCs. So it's very important to issue an order confirmation to be sure all the persons are on the right page and to be clear what is applied in this case. The second part is assist the team with the client negotiation. Well, for all technical and commercial negotiation, the, the contract manager is not the right, I mean, is not the man of the show, but is in support. So you support negotiation when it comes to discuss um, the contractual matters. Yes, you are present, you support this, you are in discussion directly with the client. But for many other parts like in commercial and technical, you might be present, but you are here to be sure that everything is reviewed, is approved, and all parties are having the right understanding to include the right documents in the contract at the end. Use the light version of the work template. This is very important within an organization because you have the template, so to be sure that you have the right ones because there is a series of approvals behind this um, final document. So when we use it, you save time to not return after that to the client to say, ah, I mean, we used the wrong, to, the wrong um, template and then we need to restart um, the negotiations since the beginning. And um, for example, the format of the proposal document, when you use it, you to be sure that everything is covered because this, doc, this um, document has been reviewed by all the parties and the stakeholders and within the organization so you save time you have the right basis to start your project and your negotiation the bank warranties is the same thing because it's approved you will not go back to your bank and see if you can use something else when you don't include the right template the same thing for the schedule and the certificates at, at the end of each um, phase the last version of the technical specifications, yes, because when we receive, I mean, a request for a bid, a client or the other party, I mean, shares their own specifications. Sometimes we need to do deviations because it's not, we cannot, I mean, uh, send the tender as per their standard um, specifications. So to be sure if there is any tender, uh, there any sorry, deviations, or any other document that have been revised in the meantime, it will be the right one in, in, the, in the tender. If there is any drawings as a base of the tender, it should be the right revision over there. Because when we come with within the same document, for example, a proposal document, you have a description of what you are selling, and then you have a drawing which is which is I mean, saying this a different thing in the right, the same document, you will have a discrepancy. So it will be, I mean, a return to negotiation because there is no prevailing rule between those two documents. It's the same. I mean, if it was like a different document, yes, it might be who is prevalent on what, but within the same document, when you have discrepancies, I mean, it's a return to the case zero of negotiation and it means loss of time, loss of money. The template and the annexures, sometimes you have in the contract, for example, you have a payment term, you have 30% down payment at the signature of the contract and the issuance of the bank warranty as per the attached template. But when you go to the attachment, you don't find any attachment. So what is this? I mean, how you will issue this bank warranty to the attachment that it doesn't exist in the contract. 
So it means a return to the case zero to negotiate with the customer if they accept our template. If not, it means like you go, you go to review with your bank if they are okay because they are the one who's going to issue, they are the one who's going to take in the risk. And then it means a, a loss of time. Same thing, some time for the schedule, we have a contract to the attached schedule. When you go to the attachment, it's not there. So you cannot execute a project without schedule. And then it means a return to zero sometimes, even if it was discussed and the other party say, no, I mean, I didn't see this. I don't agree to that. And since it's not crystal clear attached to the contract, it's not applicable. And then return to the case zero of the negotiations after signing the contract, which will be uh, a little of pressure. The test methodology and the KPIs, if any, sometimes you have a contract, you have like LERF KPIs, KPIs is key performance indicators uh, to achieve, but they are not well defined. I mean, who are those, what are those KPIs? What you need to do to achieve them? What is the documentation related to them? What is the methodology? How many times? to run a plant or to do tests to achieve this. If it's not clear, and then at the end of the pro project, you will find yourself negotiation, negotiating from zero about those points that they could be easily clarified at the tender stage. Now, passing to some key clauses. So there are a contract, it's a lot of clauses, but it's just, um, take here for me some clauses that they are super important to clarify at the tender stage and even amend if they are there is a discrepancy after the contract signature right after the kickoff meeting uh with the when all the parties are involved the first one for me is the scope of work if your scope of work is not defined it means like a contract is full of discrepancies so take time to clarify the scope of work during the proposal. If you will lose two, three weeks at the proposal phase, it's all a benefit after that because it will be clear during the execution who is doing what, what you need to do, how and when. Avoid contradictions that might that might be raised. Sometimes when the definitions they are not clear about who is doing what will have a discrepancy, will have, I mean, contradiction. If there is, if we have this contradiction, I mean, the contract, it will, it's full of discrepancies. So it will need to be crystal clear, the scope of work. And this is, it goes to the uh, definition of the party's task. A project, you know, in almost the time, it's not only one party who is performing everything. So it's, it's I mean, they come and work, it's, each party have their own tasks. Be sure it's crystal clear who is doing what and not in the middle of the contract. I mean, a party comes and says, no, it's not for me, it's for you. And the other party says, no, it's for you, it's not for me. Then it will be, I mean, the return to negotiation, again, that means loss of time, loss of money. And then, as I said, clarification of the deliverable when it comes to the KPIs, to documentation, to anything that can be defined as deliverable be sure that we know what is it that we know the procedure to achieve to achieve it contractual schedule very important that the contract will have a schedule even if it's a date delivery one date even if when you have a service contract it's one date also to perform service but it's a key point without schedule there is no contract really that makes sense to be honest this schedule needs to um needs to show the party's obligation i mean if other party needs to give something it needs to be sure when because if this this task is in the critical path it needs to be crystal clear because if it's not given by time and on time it will jeopardize all the contract uh, schedule. If we have a penalized milestone, for example, we have a delivery as penalized milestone, DAP, 
I mean, delivering to site. And then you go to the schedule. You don't have this 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 milestone. I mean, defined on the schedule. So if there is a delay, customer or the other party gonna tell you, ah, oh, you are delayed. And you say, no, I'm not. You will be right because there is no date on the schedule. You don't know when this delay will occur. So to be sure that any penalized date, any penalized milestone is a part of the schedule. And also the payment terms for me, it's very important to have them because you have payments term in the contract but you don't have any idea about the date. So it will be at least, it will give you an idea about your cash flow, how it will occur because you have dates in, in the schedule. Contractual language. In international projects, for me, it's very important to, to, to define the contractual language. You have a contract, for example, a client in France, supplier, I don't know, in, in India. And then if there is nothing defined in the contract, so you might receive some drawings in French. And in India, I mean, it's not a common speaking language, French. So how it's not defined. So who is going to be in charge of the translation of those documentation? Even at the end for the manuals of operation, you'll receive them, for example, in French. Nothing is, is, is defined. So a translation is a mandatory over here. Who's gonna take care of this cost? So it should be very, very specified, the contractual language for the communications, for the documentation, even sometimes for some site works. We have, I have been witnessing some cases in this, uh, in this regard, and the contract is silent about the site people language. And then the contract, I mean, people and, and the client side, they speak only, for example, German. And the people that we sent, they are no German, they don't speak German. So, and we have a discrepancy over here. People, they cannot communicate to each other directly. So we need someone to translate. Who's gonna take in charge this? If it's not crystal clear in the contract, it will be a negotiation. We might lose time. It will be a, a source of frustration. So it should be crystal clear. Even for the arbitration, sometimes it's not there. And, and then when you go to the arbitration in this country, in this governing law in the contract, it's not the same language with which all the notifications, even the contract. So who's going to take care of the translations? All this, if we define the, the language that prevalent in the contract, it can resolve all these issues. Commencement date. Sometimes we take it by default that commencement date is the coming into force. I mean, it's the contract signature. And sometimes either people can understand that it's the payment of the down payment, the down payment. Sometimes it's mentioned in a contract document, it's the down payment and another contract document, I mean, annexures, for example, that it's the coming into force. So how? The contract will start. Is it the coming into force? Is it the commencement date? So it should be clear that this date is a key date, is the T0 of the schedule. It should be crystal clear defined. And even <clears throat> mentioned in the schedule. So it should be, for me, this is the key. If there is a discrepancy since the starting of the contract, then I mean, it will be frustration since the start of the contract. Contract documents and rules of precedence. You have a contract, I have annexures. So it should be clear what is included as contract that defines the contract document, all the integral parts of the contract and the rule of precedence. In case of confusion, who is preceded on what? For example, you have the contract uh, document it's staying like layer of clauses such I don't know for example uh, liquidity damages at 0 0.5 percent maximum for example and then you have an annexure proposal document or other TNCs it stays five percent maximum if you have a rule of precedent 
precedents, then the problem is resolved. The, the one precedent is the one who is prevalent, is the one who's gonna uh, give us rules. But if you have like a bunch of documents and you find a discrepancy and you don't have a rule of precedence, then it will be a, it will be a, again, negotiations and interpretations and uh, uh, wasted time during the execution. Warranty. The warranty period for me, it's also a very key clause that we need to have. Usually we have a warranty period, uh, two years, for example. And then if something happened during the execution, so these two years can never start because the milestone that make it start have been delayed until further notice. It's very important to make a cap under your own control. You know, you go with these two years, but in case of delay or at any case, make it as a cap, like with an event under your own control. Also, there are other uh, warranties um, as uh, by the law. I don't know in, in India, because there is a latent defect as per the law, and I don't know about the, uh, their, their um, legal warranties, but for example, in France, you have a legal warranty defined by the law, and you have the latent defect. And they are, of course, um, while longer, comparing to the contractual uh, warranty period that you, you have. So it's always better to exclude something that you don't have control on, that you don't know how, how when it can occur, that your budget, contractual budget, doesn't take this risk into consideration. Otherwise, it will be super uh, expensive and not competitive. So to be sure that you explain all this to your customers, and of course, if they insist, that this legal and latent defect warranties are included to be sure that you have this risk for, and you have this price for this might be extension of warranty period included on your, in your uh, budget. Payment conditions. Of course, um, when you have like a project, you have a very um, many payment conditions. So to be sure that it's, you didn't just decide like this or just, I mean, a party sales steam could be decide this to make the client happy. You need to be sure that the organization is aligned with this. That means the finance team that are aligned and they are comfortable with that, with the cash flow of the project. That for, I mean, some clauses, some um, payment terms that are defined by some, by some um, events out of your control, such for example, uh, reach of the KPIs when the client, I mean, uh, uh, needs to give some things or needs to give access, that you make a cap with an event under your control, such a delivery. So to be sure that everything you have a control, because in case of suspension, in case of uh, extension of the planning, your cash flow will not stay away. At least you have, you will have a card to stay around the table with the customer and negotiate. Notice, this is a very, very important clause as well, because in some contracts, you will have a frame, time frame to notice. And if you don't notice within this time frame, your claim will become void and nil. So, even if you have occurred costs, you have occurred, I mean, uh, you have uh, occurred some some damages, you cannot claim them because you didn't submit your, at least your notice of claim within the time frame defined in the contract. Schedule liquid damages, there are two points here for me that we should we should take in mind always. The first one is when you have a project and you are responsible for um, the delivery as per an incoterm. For example, I don't know if you have you are familiar with incoterms, but we have such incoterms such CFR and CIF. It's always, for example, you are 
I mean, you are a seller in India and you will deliver uh, products to France. When you say CF, CIF Marseille, it means like you will deliver from India the equipment to the port in France, Marseille. Okay. But even if you are in charge of the, I mean, of the, of the transportation of the, of the goods, if you are labeled to LDs, it doesn't mean that the LDs will, I mean, go out when the equipment reach out the port. No, the definition of the, the income term is super important, is that you fulfill your obligation when you put the goods at the vessel at the port of departure. So even if the equipment is still in the water, it still didn't reach this port of, of destination, but as per the Incutem, you are, you fulfill your obligation when you put it on the vessel at the port of departure. In a delay after that, you are not responsible for, you are not labeled for, you will not receive delays for. So you need to be sure that you are aware about your rights and obligations under the income term that is a, a contractual income term under the contract. The second uh, second uh, point regarding the LDs, the liquidated damages, is we have some jurisdictions, some laws, such Germany and South Africa, for example, they allow both liquidated damages and penalties. It means that if, for example, in a contract, you have, I don't know, 0.2% per week for a maximum of five weeks. If you don't say that the LDs are the sole and only remedy in case of delay, the customer can claim, in addition to this 5%, can claim for you other damages that they were generated by this delay. So be sure that you cap your LDs, you, I can tell, close, frame, secure your liability under the contract in case of delay. Liability. So this is also very important. Under the contract, you need to cap your liability. You need to cap your contractual liability. If there is like a very risky project and you have high risks you need to cap your liability and even when the customer requests for more liability to be sure that it's within the budget to exclude unmeasured uh, damages something that you don't uh, you don't control like consequential damages indirect damages that can be super huge that even your insurance it's not covering them so to be sure that you exclude those kind of damages. Something under your, it's not under your control, excluded. Governing law, as I said, like you cannot sign a contract when you don't know what is your governing law. So be sure that you choose the governing law that you are not, that you are comfortable with. It means like at least you have access to this law in case of uh, in case of conflict, in case that you're going to go to court. So to be sure that this country, this place, it's accessible to it. Even if you don't have your own uh, affiliate or partner or um, an office over there, at least is accessible to you guys. The arbitration and the court, as I said, is accessible. The law is comfortable and exclude articles that they might be out of your control that you don't budget it such latent defect latent and warranty um legal warranty as we discussed before because this is it for the for the key clauses now i will work you to some um negotiation tips that i have developed with time uh that i have read about as well and i have witness i saw it on the other parts as well for me one of the most um, 
tips of negotiations. The first one is prepare your file. It's well defined it, your scope, your target. For example, you go, you have a project to 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 negotiate. You know you, you will set your limits because nobody gonna accept what you what you want at hundred percent. You will always find a compromise. So you know this is what I'm presenting, and this is are my limits. So to be sure that you know this and everything is validated by the organization so you will not go negotiate something and after that when you i mean you come okay this is a result and everyone will say no we cannot accept this very very important to prepare set your limits and prepare your second level based on limit because um if you come to a negotiation and put everything on the table since the beginning you will not have cards to play after that. So always have something in your pocket. Always don't put everything at the first minute on the table. Second one is listen to your counterpart. You, you need to know the arguments and prepare a counter argument in your mind. I mean, when they, they are talking, is sometimes they are helping you. They are giving you some points to be used. They are I mean, giving you as well points to develop. So listen and note and analyze and don't interrupt their argumentation. You need to be a good listener. Even you disagree, let them finish. And then after that, when you have your chance to talk, then you can present. But by listening, you have everything set in your mind. So you know what to avoid, what to say and when. Because if even me and my personally, if I talk and someone interrupts me, I will be frustrated. And when you have a frustration in the negotiation, it doesn't help. So you need to listen and you know uh, after that counterpart. Know your counterpart. You need to analyze them. Adapt the discussion to them to keep them interested. And also avoid subject of misunderstanding and disagreement. When I say this is you have someone in front of you that they are not technical, for example. I mean, there are some techniques that they are super, I mean, complicated. So you need to adapt the discussion to keep them interested. Because if you start going, even as a contract manager, at certain point when you are working within an organization, you start knowing some technique. But on the other part, they don't know. I mean, you need to adapt the discussion because if not, you will lose your inter their interest. And after that, you will talk in right, they will talk in left, and it will be very difficult to bring everyone into the table, to bring everyone interested to talk. So very important to adapt the discussion and also to avoid some subjects of misunderstanding, disagreement. Sometimes it could be very simple thing. Like people, they are not, they are very, I can tell, for example, for soccer, football, they are very into that and they are very, I can tell, to the extreme about some some teams. But you go and you talk to the opposite way. You choose like a team that it's like the pure enemy of this team. Even if it's out of work, but it can create frustration. It can... I mean, you, people can lose interest just for this simple thing. So just avoid. I mean, if people also for politics, they are, I mean, extreme about some point of view, avoid this at all. Don't talk about it. Completely avoid it. So, I mean, to keep people interested, to, to, to um, I mean, to keep, uh, to um, take away the frustration. And we're going to talk af after that about this the importance of the emotional intelligence. Communicate clear and avoid ambiguity. You need, I mean, even if to make people happy, don't promise something that you cannot fulfill. You need to stay credible, clear, avoid this gray areas. Even if, I mean, to sometimes you think that by promising, I mean, they will be interested, you can, 
have a win, but if you promise something, you will not fulfill it, it will be a complete failure. So don't do that. I mean, crystal clear, communication should be clear, the language should be clear, out of ambiguity. We need to follow up, to be active and not reactive. I mean, negotiation happen, everyone goes to his place, we need to follow up, Just don't wait for the other party to come to you so to react. You need to be the man of the show, to always have controlled, at least the illusion of control. And also, for me, I always do that, and I find it very helpful. When you go to a negotiation, you need to set an agenda, because if you go to the table and just everyone start talking about their, I mean, their, the things that they, the interests and more, so we will lose the sense of the communication of the meeting. You need to set an agenda, to follow this agenda. So even if like people will jump from a subject to another, okay, so we'll discuss about this later. It's coming. I mean, let's discuss about this first. Repeating, this is, I read it in a book and I find it, I find when I read it, I find myself sometimes using it almost the time and even, I mean, by, by some reflex, I mean, even our counterpart were using it sometimes when you are 100 percent sure about the position you will be repeated and this is the only way to stay credible because there is no other for you there is no other i mean uh, solution and you will notice it because i mean even if by going to some arguments you will be saying the same thing but with different way and you will notice that you are saying the same thing. This is the only way, this is the only solution. So this technique, I read it and I use this, I mean, many times it's called repeating. So if when you are repeating, I mean, you're sure this is the only solution, but you have all the arguments that makes you to be sure. When in time, I know it's not always the case, but some, uh, some cases they need time because if you rush them it's i mean a sure word toward the failure so when some cases they need time you need i mean we need to give this winning time i can give you an example for that you have a contract and sometimes you have um, a cdo change variation order or like an additional work to the contract and it's a super critical subject, a very high amount that it needs approval from the other parts, it needs discussion more, uh, more sometimes just give it time for them to, to well decorticate it. So give it time, because if, I mean, parties are still talking, are still uh, there present, are still asking questions, it's not a signature for a failure yet. And I read it in a book <clears throat> it called um, Never Split a Difference. They said, and it was like um, an agent of, from the FBI who, who write this book. And he said a very I mean, important sentence. They said, when they are talking, they are not shooting. And this is, it was when I, after reflex, I said, it's true. Because when people, they are still talking, negotiation, negotiating, even they are still saying no, it's not still signed, it's just talking. So give it time. In some other cases, time, it could be a way of pressure on both parties because it's a rush. We need to, to act fast. And then for the other party, it's, I mean, a way to make pressure to get the right price that they want. So it can be in both, I mean, in both uh, ways. But it's very good technique that it works. As I said before, um, the emotional intelligence, this is, it's thought to be um, a very, very um, important subject on like a lot of articles are written in this regard, a lot of books are written in this regard. And this is, I guess, something that we were using since ages, but just people, they are starting to notice it. And I mean, 
make it uh, more visible. Uh, sometimes showing empathy, it's needed in the context. It doesn't mean, I mean, it's always a failure or it's always like a sign of weakness. When you make, I mean, you make, you show empathy that you understand the pain of people, that you feel sorry for them. It doesn't mean that you are weak. It doesn't mean that you agree that you are responsible for their pain. But on some people, I mean, you need to feel this. I mean, you, they need to, to see that you show empathy, you are here, I mean, for them just not to make a deal and walk. Even if this is what's going to happen, to be honest. But at least you are human. You are not just a machine that needs to check to, to go. And it, it it's at least, I mean, on the other part of the table, it's a human being. So there are emotions. It can be empathy, it can be frustration, it can be trust, it can be lack of trust, but at least we need to use all this mix of emotions to, to make a deal. Um, also, when the trust is created for me, the half of the work is done, or it's not. If it's not, all the work is done, because when the trust is here, I mean, the client or the parties, they became partner, business partners for a long time because they trust each other. They trust that when they need something, the other part will act fast. They trust that they, this part is, I mean, acting on a fair basis, acting on an honest basis. So for me, we should not ignore the, I mean, the emotional for people, for the other parts. We need to use them and use them on the right way. Let's hear counterpart bid against themselves. I'm sure that everyone around this table that you have experience on this. For example, and here I put a question that I'm sure that all of us have used it. For example, we are in a uh, negotiation and the other part used like an, a completely abusive clause that you know that you cannot agree on that. It's just impossible. The clause itself, it's not realistic. So we always find, I mean, ask the question, how can we agree on that? And then they start bidding again themselves. They start coming with counterparts, a counter proposals. It's very, very interesting when they start coming with counter proposal, or sometimes they start coming with a price. So keep, let them come. They are breaking the work for you. They are, I mean, gaining steps for you. So let them come and then, of course, prepare your counter offer if they don't come with something uh, something um, acceptable for you. The last one here for me is the powerful words in negotiation. When? I mean, you start hearing fair enough or that's right. For me, you are almost there. They are super powerful, but there is a big, big, big work behind this to bring it to those to those words um because it confirms the alignment of the parties it confirms when you say that's right it means like they understand you that's they understand your 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 um, requests they understand what do you need and when you say they say or you say it's not fair and then start talking 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 and then they say fair enough or that's right for me that's it, the deal, it's almost here. And they maximize the trust and that leads completely to a, a big yes. So for me, when we work, 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 and then we, I mean, here that's right or fair enough. For me, I mean, we're almost there, that's it. After this negotiation tips, so as we did for the last session, I will give you some examples and then before concluding. So, the example number one regarding the contract tenancies. So, a seller wins a contract for a supply installation and commissioning for a factory with a client co for a contract price for three million. Both parties have made a lot of work, agreed on contractual documents, and the TNCs to be applied in the contract. So we shake hands, bye-bye, we are with it for the order. 
the client issue the order mentioning only their own general TNCs and they said that this is, I mean, the only applicable TNCs, this the general client co-TNCs that the seller have never seen or received. And in the PO, it's mentioned this is the only TNCs applicable. What happened? The seller was happy that they are, oh, yay, we received, the, we received the PO, and then they start the execution of the project. A delay caused by the supplier occurred. Okay? And then, in this case, what are the actual TNCs applicable for this PO, and why? What shall the seller do normally in this situation? So I will give you 10 seconds to think about it and then show you the answers and see if you agree with my answers. Okay. So what are the actual TNCs applicable in this PO and why? For me, the general client scope TNCs, even if the seller have never seen or received them, are fully enforced, are applicable in this case. So what the seller, why over here? Because they are mentioned in the PO and nothing else mentioned. So they are fully applicable. And what the seller shall do normally in this situation is issue an order confirmation. When you, you talk to the customer, you agree uh, everything, and then you receive something completely. Because normally those TNCs, it doesn't mean that the client ignored it. No, it means just their system. It's, I mean, in general, they do that by, by, uh, by default. It's configured like that, it happens. And in big companies, it's always like the case. So, the supplier needed absolutely to order, I mean, issue order confirmation, confirming that what they have discussed both before the contract signature are the only applicable and valid uh, um, TNCs in this case. Because, I mean, people, they are not permanent in organization. So, for example, they have signed everything, the PO come, no order confirmation arise. Those people that need to negotiate the contract, they are not here anymore. So, as we say in French, les paroles s'envolent, les écrits restent. It means words fly and written things stays. So, those people, they weren't aware, they don't know what happened. They come, oh, we have a PO, we have those DLCs, that's it. This is what gonna, gonna fit. Second example. So, during the commissioning phase, we have a seller with a contract of the supply installation and commissioning for an iced tea factory, contract of 3 million, to produce 1,000 liters per hour for an iced tea. So the seller have mentioned in the handover of the factory that the TOC will be pronounced when the factory produces 1,000 liters per hour and the payment will release accordingly. So the seller achieved the capacity, but the client refused to sign the TOC, taken over certificate, to really end, of course, re refused to release the payment. And the client requests the seller to perform more tests. So what could be done to avoid that situation? And the question, can the seller claim to the client to go those additional tests by default? I will give you 10 seconds to think about it. And then I will show you the answers and see if you agree with me. Okay. So what could be done to avoid such situation? for me is well defined the test procedure and methodology to it, to reach out the KPIs. As we said, if you could um, see during the presentation, it's one of the main clauses, the main 
points to define the deliverables. KPI could be could be a document, could be uh, anything, but for the KPIs over here, for example, there is a capacity. But how will we reach it? What the tests that we should do? How many times we should run the factory, for example, to reach it? If nothing is defined, it will be a negotiation. And what can the sell, can the seller claim per default to decline those additional tests? For me, is a no. It will not be a default a claim per default because their tests are not defined as extra in the contract. The contract is silent, so it means going to negotiation. But the seller will be in a weak situation because they will be under pressure. They have payment blocked, cash flow not, not released, and they have people on site. It means additional time, additional money that they have, I mean, a, a loss coming from everywhere. And it will be, sorry, it will be at the client's co mercy and fairness because the, client, the seller will be stuck on site. It will be doing some tests, just try to, to unlock the situation and at least release the cash that it might be a big amount over their city. And they don't have any budget for that. And then the client maybe tell them, oh, but I need my factory, do, do me this, and then let's discuss after. But after, all the work will be done. There will be no way to make pressure on the client. Last example, I choose this one for you uh, on the warranty period. So our same example, client when a contract, sorry, seller when a contract for supply insertion and commissioning for a factory for 3 million. The warranty period under the contract is one year starting from the end of commissioning. The seller has delivered the equipment to the site and the client has decided to store the equipment and suspend the project for two years. So when will the contract will warranty expire in this case? What would the seller do in this case to secure such situation? 10 seconds, give you time to think about it. And then let's, I'll share with you my answers. Okay, so when will the warranty period expires in this case? For me, it's two years after the end of the commissioning. Commissioning might never happen. Might happen after two years. Sorry, it's one year. It's a contract, it's one year. So it might happen. Uh, no, two years. It might never happen. Might be suspended for four until further notice. But this warranty period will never start and will never expire in this case. So what should the seller in this case do to secure uh, the situation? For me, is cap the warranty, at least in case of delay out of its control, by some events which he might have control on. Such delivery of the equipment, for example, make, okay, will expire one year after the commissioning, but not later than one year and a half after delivery, for example. At least cap it by something under the control because the delivery is something under its own control. And you will tell me, ah, but sometimes the customer will request us to store the equipment in our own facilities. So even with that, the warranty period will not start. I can tell when we store the equipment under our own facilities, it yes, will have a risk, it will not start, but we can always negotiate to deliver to the to the people, I mean, to the uh, client, because uh, when the, the, where the storage, um, the storage period will be super um, long because the customer will make the storage fees very high to them, not really advantages to them while they have uh, free space they can store at their own risk. 
but at least we'll have control on that. But when there is no cap, we'll have no control. So as a conclusion, uh, I have been, uh, we have discussed this shimmy that I make for me, it's the, the contract management phases, it's wild complicated than that, but this shima or this um, sketch I can tell over here, it gives the main phases uh, of the contract uh, management life cycle. Uh, they are aligned, of course, with any project. Um, so we have been uh, discussing who is doing what during these different phases, how and where the contract manager is acting during the contract life, rights and obligation of the parties. We have been defining this in the day number one, and it shows each party is doing what, but in a very general uh, level. The key clauses that we need to keep in mind, we need always to fight for, we need always to find a compromise for, some negotiation tips that for me I have uh, developed on time and I saw with my experience that even sometimes our the, the counterparts are using um, as by, the, by default. To, for me, succeed all this as contract management, as negotiation, there is a key, is the same understanding of the rights and obligations. We need to know what the other party wants and what we want to make it as a well-defined scope and well-defined right and obligation during the contract life cycle and also clear communication and record that for me are priceless. <clears throat> contract management is an I mean projects in the in general, it's a very, very big and uh, large domain that two presentations are not enough to describe them to go deeply in details. There are other uh, topics that they are super important and one that it comes to practice, I can tell, to in any uh, contract or project, it's extension of times, delays. So there are some uh, mainly um, we see them during the execution uh, phase. Um, well, for me, I hope that you enjoyed this second session. Um, if you have any questions, now I will pass it to you. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, yeah, please let me go through the comments. Yeah, so here uh, I have a, I have two comments from Ravina. Uh, yes, football agents have a lot to go through during negotiations. Extreme scenarios are very common. To get a win-win situation in negotiation doesn't work every time. And uh, one more thing is, uh, nowadays reputation has become a no way out. So she has echoed with whatever you have said. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the second one? I will just go my volume. Can you repeat the second one, please? Yeah, no, uh, nowadays reputation has become no way out. No way out. Yeah. I don't really understand what that means, to be honest. <laughs> okay, Pravina, so do you want to unmute yourself and uh, tell about the same? Yeah, hi, Camilia. Hi, Kritika. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, I recently came across a situation wherein I was uh, talking uh, to an athlete. Uh, I'm more into sports contracts and uh, athlete management. Uh, apart from IT contracts. So um, I had to put the same clause uh, in front of, uh, you know, the sponsor in so many ways that I really had uh, no way out rather than to, you know, uh, get uh, a win-win situation, although I, I could make it 70-30 uh, for us in that negotiation deal. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, most of the times what I have seen nowadays is if you are, if you if you want something, then you need to know ways wherein, you know, the uh, vocabulary plays an important role in there, although the core uh, clause remains the same. Yeah, 
let me share with you um, an, an experience of mine. This is my own experience uh, while I, uh, I experienced this repeating. Um, I was working in a project uh, when I was in Africa with a sub supplier and we were negotiating an extra uh, to the contract. Okay. And from my point of view, it wasn't an extra, it was actually an extra to the contract, but we had like the price unit already defined. So in the contract, I don't remember the details, but for example, on contract, it was just two quantities, okay, of this item. And we, uh, I mean, we uh, at the end finished to order four with the same item. And the subcontractor comes to me and he said, yes, okay, we have the price in the contract, but now it's an extra. So I need to reevaluate the price. And they said, no. I mean, we have a unit price defined in a contract. We use the same. And I was repeating this for one year and a half. And at the end, they accepted to use the same contract, I mean, the same unit price because it's already defined in the contract and there is no way to deviate from it. So, yes. So, yeah, it's working all the time. But, you know, like for some, when you are convinced about your, this is why I said when you are 100 convinced, sure convinced about your, your position, so you will say it in a different way. And at the end, because you have no choice, <laughs> you know what I mean? At the end, yes. You think. <laughs> and yeah. and that, uh, that looks uh, and seems perfect in that particular situation, the situation also, because you know what you want. You try to get what you are discussing and negotiating over there for your client and it becomes a uh, very uh, at times it becomes uh, I won't say difficult but yes to convince somebody on a particular point which is already uh, fortunate or unfortunate that particular part is already a part of the contract terms and conditions in the contract but still you have to do a lot of negotiation there yeah and thank exactly. you for sharing your experience my pleasure Okay, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, thank you so much, Camilla. Thank you so very much for being here and keeping the sports uh, really high. And yeah, it was really informative and we absolutely learned a lot. I, I personally had a lot of learning from this and uh, thank you really from the bottom of my heart and yes we would like to have more sessions and obviously with more people too uh, like i said we would be uh, posting a demo session so that people are not uh, a short video so that people are not